Can you there we go. It? There we go. Okay. These are the, uh, basically, these are the spaceships I'll be demonstrating this evening. And as with the demo that I did in September, it's going to be me talking over video, which means that I'll get to do the entire spaceship, which takes considerably longer than I could do in a club meeting type demo. Um, the pinstriping that you see is built into the blank itself. It's, it's not inlay. So I'll go over the construction of the blank and then the turning is fairly straightforward. Uh, the creation of the little engine and the nose cone, the inlaying of the portholes, the creation of the fins. The creation of the fins actually takes longer than everything else. It is very time consuming. So there's a good bit about that. And then the finishing process. Um, let's see. No. All right, so the blank is created from three layers of wood. In this case, I'm using um, three quarter inch thick. It's called alo wood. It's not made anymore. It was a commercially produced resin impregnated and dyed wood that was out in um, probably the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, I used, Rockler used to sell it and I, I remember seeing it a couple of other places, possibly even Home Depot or Lowe's or someplace like that, but it hasn't been sold for quite a while. Um, this is actually from the last of the stock that I had of it. Um, it, I used it for the color because this is a replication of a prior piece that I did that used this, this wood. Um, in any event, the top layer and the bottom layer are solid you know, one piece of aloe wood, the middle layer is split into three sections and then all the layers are separated with uh, maple veneer. So you get a um, something that looks kind of like an H with wood in the middle or with black wood surrounding it. The spaceship itself fits inside the blank, obviously. Uh, it's basically just a sphere or hemisphere up at the top section. And then I do a straight section down the sides to mount the fins onto. Uh, there's really nothing very complicated about the turning. The, the key parts are the, the fins and the, um, the way the blank is laminated. And the, the lamination, obviously you can laminate blanks to do a lot of different things. This is just what I'm happening to do with it. Um, And I have slides about how I did that as well. So what I do is I cut the wood to size and then I cut strips of veneer and I will glue the, the wood to the veneer itself and then separate it off and trim everything afterwards. Um, it's I find it easier to work this way than to try to cut the veneer to the exact size and not get it to slip around um, I'm perfectly willing to do a little bit of trimming afterwards. Uh, this is the, these are the larger pieces. For this particular project, I was making two spaceships that had to be very close to identical with each other. So I ended up making three separate blanks and I would, I turned all three of them and I would pick the two that matched the closest for the final piece. Uh, I, I re ideally, if I have enough material, I will do this whenever I'm making a project. I'll, I'll make more than one blank so that if I have to, if I sc screw something up or there's a problem with one of the blanks, I don't have to do all of the setup and the, to spend the time doing the glue up and the tooling and everything again. I can just go to a backup blank. Worst case, I've burned an extra blank Best case, I have something that I can use for a second project down the road. So in this case, I have a third blank that I will turn into something else or turn into another spaceship. Uh, this is basically how I laid out everything for the glue up. Um, it's really important 
when I'm doing this to have all of my pieces laid out and ready and all of the equipment that I'm going to need ready to go because once the glue goes on there's not a lot of working time. I'm using regular tight bond and I could use the extended tight bond but it really doesn't make a lot of a difference and this, these pieces are small enough as long as I work efficiently I can get everything together before the glue starts to set up. So I use a, um, an old hotel key as a glue spreader. My husband used to travel a lot and I would have him bring home the hotel keys so that I could use them as glue spreaders. I have a ton of these things out in the workshop. Um, this is the maple side of the blank. This is the center section. And you can see the other two blanks that are also awaiting glue up back here. You can start to see the, that H pattern of the veneer. Oh, and feel free to interrupt if you have questions. I, there's nothing precious about any of this. You can interrupt me at any time. Um, I use blue tape to bind the blank before I can get clamps on it so things don't shift around. So I, you don't need a massive amount of glue. It needs to be enough to, to completely cover the surface so that you have a little bit of squeeze out, but massive squeeze out isn't really necessary and it makes it too slippery. So this is about how much glue I, I would put on one of these surfaces. And this is about uh, two and a quarter inches by three and three quarter inches. So that's all spread out. Um, I've put the two sides together first and then the top and bottom and I'm using the blue tape to keep things from shifting relative to each other. I, I only have a little bit of material here obviously so I wanna make sure that I've, I've got the most I can get out of the blank. And then after I've taped it so it doesn't shift side to side, I've got the clamp on a flat board to clamp everything up and I'll leave that overnight. So, and I have the video sped up because as I said, this would take quite a while to do otherwise. So once the veneer is on and trimmed, I use a box cutter to do the, the rough trimming and then I use sandpaper to do the final trimming. I wanna make sure the grain matches up as best as possible all around. And I had originally had it, all the, from, all the grain was, for, all the wood was from one board and I cut it wrong. So I ended up having to go to backup grain or backup center wood. Here I'm putting the um, center marks on, a, on the larger blanks. This is mostly for alignment purposes. It doesn't serve any purpose other than that on here. It's the only place the center is actually important is the very center piece of the blank. Um, the center of the, the rocket has to be the center of this central section. Otherwise the pinstriping doesn't line up properly. It's not balanced properly around the body of the rocket. Um, so laying out the center section is really kind of important. I'm using a center punch just to, to mark it for when I drill because I'm also gonna drill locator holes for my drive center and my tail center so that when the blank is all glued up, I can just mount it on those centers. I find drilling the holes gives me a more positive lock of position than just having the centers punched like this. Now onto the turning, oops, turning process. So I've drilled a half inch diameter hole with a Forstner bit at the end that's about a quarter of an inch deep. And I'm using a step center in the as a drive center and just a cone point in my one-way center. And that's got an eighth inch hole that's about a quarter of an inch deep to locate, it, it keeps the, the um, tail center in particular from drifting if my centers aren't quite lined up properly. Hey, Jonah, one quick question on the glue sure, up. Sure, sure. 
do you do you do all five pieces at once or do you glue the center section together then uh scuff that to make sure they're parallel and stuff or you know um how how do you prep your blocks to make sure that they're all the same thickness normally i would run everything through my thickness planer i would do it all at the same time so that i have all of the pieces being the, the right thickness. The only layer that's really crucial to have the thickness is the center all the one. same as the center one. The, the outer two layers can be whatever you have. Uh, and I've made blanks that are thicker or thinner depending on the effect that I want to get. Um, the only one that's really crucial that everything be exactly the same is the center. And I, I don't glue up the center separately and then scuff it or, or flatten it unless I do. <laughs> and that sounds, that sounds a little disingenuous, but in this particular case, I did not glue it up and then scuff it to flatten it. If I am doing a differently shaped center, I might, sometimes I will taper the center layers to get a different look out of the lamination effect once the piece is turned. And um, then I would glue it up separately and cut the shape that I want out of the glued up layer. So basically, in this case, the sandwich application, so you'd have two clamps on, one yep. clamping the center together, and then one clamping the outsides to the center. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, as long as everything is, is clean, all the edges are clean, all the corners are clean, and you've got, you don't have a lot of um, differences in the height, you know, where the veneer is, you don't have any rough edges it's actually fairly straightforward to just glue everything up all the pieces at once because the yeah. two outer layers hold everything together top to bottom and flatten it out. And the pressure that you get from the side keeps everything together side to side. So it's, it's relatively easy to do all the pieces together that way. Again, the only time I would do it differently is if I had changed the, the shape of the middle layer. And I have done that in the past. I've done tapered layers before and it's gluing it up is a lot more problematic than than that so back to just I'm just bringing the blank to a cylinder so I know what I have to work with for the um, size of the spaceship and that's you know there's nothing magic here I'm using a spindle roughing gouge um, one thing with having the veneer in the middle sometimes you'll get tear out at the very edges of the blank you can you can turn that away. It's really not a big deal. Um, right now, I'm marking this the area of largest diameter for the spaceship, and I leave about an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch area that that I will smooth down later. But I don't want to go inside that pencil line right now. And the first thing is to bring up that I do is bring up the taper. Um, And again, I, I really sped this up a lot because you probably don't want to see me just doing basic taper cutting. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to leave a straight surface for the fins to mate to because the, the, the spine of the fin is going to be straight. And, and I don't want to match a curved surface to a curved surface. So I've left the, the tapered section a little bit thick right now just to support it with the tail center. Uh, while I'm turning the nose to shape. I've gone from a spindle roughing or spindle roughing gouge to my spindle gouge to get the final shape there. Um, I'll take down the nose to its final dimensions, I guess. I do this all by eye. So I know the kind of shape that I want generally. I don't use templates or anything. And I will, I will bring it to that. And I'm gonna use a skew chisel um, this is, I think, a raffin skew. I got this years ago. I'm going to use this to get my body section really straight, or as straight as I can. And I'm using a ruler just to check that. If there's any gaps in the ruler or underneath the ruler, I know I have to take off more material, like here with the tail, at the very tail. If there's a bump, the ruler will rock. So I know I've got, it just helps me visualize where I have to take material.
And I really like this skew for doing this kind of work. Um, you know, as I said, I, I've made a lot of rockets in the last 15 years and um, I love this skew. So you can start to see the pinstriping showing up already where the um, outer parts of the wood have been cut away. And now I'm just blending in the um, largest diameter into, you know, the, the curved section into the flat section, basically. So what do you do with all the, all the rockets? Why do you, why do you have to build so many? Um, I sell most of my work through science fiction and fantasy convention art shows. And I've, I've literally sold probably a hundred rockets over the last 15 years. Wow. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I am the only person making these. I have never seen anybody else doing anything like this, which surprises me because, you know, it's a really simple shape and rockets are really popular. But I make a bunch of different styles and I do a bunch of different laminations and um, they sell really well. Uh, nice. People really like them. They're a lot of fun to make, except for the fins. I hate making the fins. I, I, there's no hiding that. I hate making the fins. And one of the reasons I haven't made rockets, in the, a lot of rockets in the last few years, is because uh, the, the fin making process really bothers my hands. There's a lot of hand sanding involved because the parts are so small. I can't really do it on a, on a um, belt sander or you know, cut them that way. And I just have to do it a lot of sanding by hand. So um, I really cut back on the, the number of ships that I've done in the last few years. That's why they have CNCs. You, you wouldn't be able to do it with CNC though. You'd still have to do hand cleanup and hand shaping at the end. I actually thought about that because it was, it was one thing that would justify it. These rockets are too small. If I did a bigger one, I could probably justify doing it by CNC. But for something this size, I don't think it would really work very well. You know, I thought about slotting into the rockets and doing tenons on the fins. That's a nightmare because of tear out. And because again, the parts are so small. Um, I've thought about, and that's how the spaceship gets done. I've thought about um, trying to carve them out. That's a nightmare. <laughs> a friend of mine actually is a carver and just tried carving a rocket. And we were talking about how long it takes to do the fins. Um, Oh, yeah, this is my um, my fin temp template for this. And basically what I'm doing here now is I'm laying out where the fin is going to go and I'm putting the, the marks in for the alignment of the fin. And I think I actually cut out the wrong part of the video. Damn it. Sorry. Um, there was, I showed how I put the lines on for the, for the rockets. I'm laying out the portholes. Oh, maybe I did it at the end of the video. In any event, I'm laying out the, um, the lines for the portholes now. I've got the, my box rest set up so that the point of my pencil lines up with the exact center of the, the lathe um, spindle. And I, I just line it up on the, the point of the uh, drive center. And then I lay it out on the rocket itself where I want the center line to be. So in this case, I want it to go through that, the height of that arch. And I'm making sure that the portholes are after the length of the fin. I really wish I could work this fast in real life. It would make life a lot easier. <laughs> so again, I'm using a center punch to mark my um, the spacing of my portholes. I'm just cleaning up the lines. One thing about this aloe wood, whatever they used 
for the resin and it it makes cleaning it up really easy it doesn't take shavings well it it, it makes little chips or even dust but it um it cleans up and sands up really nicely. It's not fun to work with because of the dust. Now I'm drilling for the, um, I, I drill pilot holes for the, the portholes. I'm gonna be using eighth inch um, maple dowels for the porthole inlays. And this is probably a 16th inch drill bit that I'm using just to do the pilot holes. I'm gonna countersink with a hand countersink just a little bit to break the edge so that when I come back with the larger drill bit, I don't get tear out or don't get as much tear out. Uh, it's just a little trick that I picked up from someplace. I don't remember where. But now I've come back with the eighth inch drill bit and I actually have this from a different angle so you can see what I'm doing aside from just seeing my lovely drill. Yeah, and then just gonna sand down. These are um, just slightly larger than eighth of an inch in diameter. You could use bamboo skewers and or make your own dowels and stuff too. It's I've done this with quarter inch dowels on larger pieces, and um, made my own when I'm used when I've used exotic woods or or just different colored woods that I can't get dowels for easily. Again, tight bond. I use a nail to um, get the wood into the hole or get the glue into the holes. And just kind of drip it in. And I put it in the hole, obviously, rather than on the dowel so that it gets pushed into the hole instead of getting squeezed back up. And yes, that is my chuck, my scroll chuck. Um, wrench that I'm using as a tack hammer. So you always cut your dowels before you put them in? Yeah, I, I cut them. They're not exactly the length. Yeah, they're, I, I, they're a little proud, but yeah, I do. It just makes it easier. I have a feeling I grabbed the wrong footage when I rendered this, and for which case I apologize. Because there should be a lot more going on than this right now. See, if I did that, I would probably take a washer mm -hmm. that fit around the piece, tap it in, put the washer on there and cut it on with a a back saw in the washer. Yeah, I've done that before. I have a flush cutting saw and um, I've done that. I'm still gonna have to do a little bit of cleanup and turn it off anyway, but yeah. Oh, yeah. I've, yeah. I've done stuff like that before. Usually instead of, I don't use a washer though. That's actually a good idea because it'll leave me a little bit more room. Usually I just put a piece of tape over it. Yeah, you can get a, a brass or plastic or whatever, some mm -hmm. shim stock. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I have a feeling I grabbed the wrong footage when I did this. I apologize, because there should be a lot more going on than you looking at me gluing this. There we go. So yeah, here, this is just for a different angle. So you can see a little bit better. And I'm, I'm just lining this up by eye. It's not crucial. I try to get it as vertical as possible relative to the surface itself so that I'm getting a round porthole as opposed to an oblong one or an elliptical one. But 
my eye is fine. Uh, one of these days I'll hook up a jig. I have the, the, a machinist device that I want to put on the lathe so that I can do more controlled um, drilling and, and cutting, but I haven't done it yet, so. And I'm just tapping out the shavings. I want to make sure there's nothing in the bottom. The holes only go in quarter to three eighths of an inch, maybe. Uh, and again, it, it doesn't really matter how far in you you put them, as long as it's deep enough to stay seated. It's actually this part is is actually. I find it quite a lot of fun to, to do this and see it come together. Again, the, the, really the only thing I don't like about making these is the, the fins because they're time consuming and, and finicky. But um, yeah, these are fun little projects and I've actually been kind of surprised. I haven't seen anybody else do anything like this. Um, I suppose it's possible somebody has and I just haven't come across it, but um, yeah, so here we, I'm laying in the lines again. I've cleaned off the um, portholes. I've turned it down and sanded it. And now I'm just laying in the lines for the where I want the fins to sit. I'm going to use blue tape to mark it off, or mask it off, rather, before I do any finishing. I'm just going to cut it into little strips that are approximately the same width as my fins, line it up do a test and um, you know, if I have to, I'll replace the tape, which I kind of do a lot of times. Um, yeah, the idea is that this area is going to end up taking glue. So I don't want, I don't want to have any more finish under there than I have to. Some will get under the tape potentially, but if I'm, if I burnish it carefully enough, it's, it actually stays on really well throughout the finishing process. It's worked quite well for me. And I will go back and clean up that area again before I attach the fins. I'm using the uh, handle of a um, chip brush, you know, just a really cheap brush that I use to brush off the shavings on my lathe to burnish the tape down. It's the contours of it work really nicely and it doesn't damage the wood unless I'm using a really, really soft wood. It's better than just rubbing over it with my finger. Um, I get a, a better seal. So again, this is just a different angle uh, same thing, and you can see it's just a chip brush. And I have the blue and green tape around it so I can see it in my workshop when I put it down on the lathe or someplace else, because I have a tendency to lose my chip brushes. Oh, hang on. Um, I wanted to go to this first. These are the tools that I'm using to do the fin layout and shaping. Uh, basically, I've got a template that I've cut. I, I have probably 20 or 30 different fin shapes that I've used over the years. Every time I, I do rockets, I tend to vary the fins a little bit from rocket body to rocket body. So I make a template and I keep it. And then if I want to go back and do a similar fin, I can take it out and I can make a variation on that, or I can use the one that I have. In this case, this is the same fin template that I use to make the piece that this is a replica of. So I'm just laying it out on my fin stock, which is roughly a quarter of an inch thick. Uh, and again, it's this hollow wood. It's just strips that I sawed off the board. Um, 
I, as I said, I didn't have a lot of this aloe wood left it's, and it's not being manufactured anymore. So I was kind of limited with what I could do. And I, I had a couple of quarter inch strips and I needed to make a, a, you know more. So normally I would work with about eighth inch thick stock, maybe, maybe three sixteenth inch stock, stock for fins this size. So these are actually quite a bit thicker than I'm used to working with. Um, but I'm just laying it out with a pencil and you can see the um, lines on the shorter piece of wood already, the fins. Then I'll take it to the bandsaw and cut out the shape, the rough shape. I'll do the exterior um, convex curves on my disc sander. So I'll do the spine and the, um, the shoulder and maybe the tip of the nose and the tail on the disc sander and then do the inner radius on my oscillating spindle sander. Or what I used to do before I got the oscillating spindle sander was I, I had a, a sanding drum in my drill press. Uh, and then in order to meet the flat back of the fin to the rounded spaceship, I have to hollow out the back of the fin. So I use a variety of um, round rasps and files and sandpaper around dowel rods. And then I clamp the fin with a little bit of leather so it doesn't get uh, dinged. And I just, I hollow out this, this back area. This is the, the area that you see here is the part that's gonna stick onto the, the rocket side. So that area has to be hollowed. It doesn't have to be a perfect match for the curve, but it has to be hollow enough so that only the outermost parts of the the edge are touching the rocket and then the interior can hold some um, either thick super glue or epoxy depending on, on what I use to adhere the fin to the rocket. And then this is, I'm just doing a final test to see, you know, that it looks okay with the, my design. And I've, I've got this, normally I would do this on a workbench, but because the cameras are here at my lathe and I wanted to at least be able to show this, how I do this. Um, yeah, with the, with the fin back flat before it's hollowed, it, obviously it doesn't meet very well with the uh, side of the spaceship. So I'm gonna have to hollow everything out. But I've just got a um, wooden, parallel jaw clamp, clamp to my, the ways of my workbench or my lathe rather. And um, it's actually really nice for holding the fins. Normally I would do this on my drill press where it's a little bit, I can raise the table a bit so that it's up closer to eye level or chest level to make it easier to work on. You know, and then it's just a question of using the tools, the rasps and the files and the um, sandpaper and just hollowing that, that central area there. Okay, Joan, I know I chime in way too much, but... Not at all, not at all. Um, did you ever think about um, maybe some double-sided tape with sandpaper to your actual spaceship? Yeah, and I actually, I, I did actually. And it, it because the ship is tapered, it ends up not being as easy as you would think to get the right curve. This okay. Actually, this ends up being a lot easier. Okay. Uh, and you don't have a router table, do you, to use a flush well, trim? I have a router table, and I tried doing that, and I tried using a bullnose bit to do the curve, and it was not pretty. Well, no, I'm thinking for the profile with a oh, flush yeah, you, trim. You could, if if I had a template, if I wanted to do, to attach the template to the fin, yes, I could do that. I would still have to do hand sanding to clean up the edges, though. Yeah. Um, it, it, there's really no way to avoid the hand sanding, I, really. I've thought about a lot of this stuff. Um, but yeah, the, I, I did try doing a template. Um, it's, it's just not, the pieces are so small. I, I even have a Dremel router table, so I could put my Dremel in the router table and do it with really tiny bits. And it's just not, there's still just too much um, risk of my fingers. And I still have to do a lot of cleanup. Um, it ends up just being a, a little bit easier to do it this way. 
So here I'm just marking out where I'm going to use um, nails to attach the fins to the rockets. I, use, I cut off um, three penny nails. I cut the heads off and I, I cut them down to the size that I need. Um, and when I'm drilling these, I, I don't drill them holding the fin in my hand because it's a really easy way to get a drill bit in your finger. Don't ask me how I know that. Um, so I just use a the, the leather strip again and hold it in a little pinch clamp and drill in as straight as I can. Now I can't actually do this on the drill press and I have, it's just that for, again, for this. And because not everybody has a drill press that I show how to do these things. Uh, this is just a good way to do it by hand. Using one of those wooden um, parallel jaw clamps on the drill press is actually quite good so long as you brace up underneath so that the, the fin doesn't shift when you're drilling. And now I'm going to just start the sanding process. I'm using a tile actually. This is a, a tile I got at Home Depot years ago as a flat surface for my sandpaper. And right now I'm just marking the center of the spine, the outer spine of the, the fin, because I'm going to try to taper it down on both sides to um, match on both sides basically. I want it to be thick at the side that meets the rocket and then taper up on the side that's away from the rocket. And this is a little bit of an awkward shape to do that with because it's got that scoop in the nose. If I had done a um, curved, convex curved shoulder on the nose, it would have been a little bit easier to um, get a nice taper all the way across. So yeah, sanding's a thing. This wood does sand up nicely though. It, it is very easy to work. It's a lot harder. I did. I had to do a rocket once for somebody that was in um, Maple and Bubinga and the fins were Bubinga and oh my God, that was, the sanding for that was awful. And, and those were big enough that I could actually use the belt sander and it was, it was still awful because I had to be careful not to burn it. So now I'm just knocking down the um, sharp edges again by hand um, so that every all of the, the corners are a little bit rounded over. And the white sheet of paper is just there so you can see it because the tile is too dark otherwise. And I've got the sandpaper wrapped around an old um, 3M sanding sponge, actually. I think it's um, neoprene. You could probably use a mouse pad. It gives enough backing to um, cushion the, the sandpaper as it's going around the, the edges. And then when I need to, I um, do it. And I'll sand that up through 400 grit. So now we're done with sanding. This is um, making the engine. It's just a um, three quarter inch square maple that I cut off a board. And one length of maple will give me an engine and a nose spike. So we'll just see the engine part here. The nose spike will be separate. They'll bring enough area for the um, engine out to a cylinder. Again, I'm going to apologize, but have you tried flap sanders? Yes. Same thing. The parts are very small and yeah. um, holding a flap sander, holding a part and a flap sander, it, it gets a little challenging. If I hold it with a, a clamp of some kind, I am not sanding everything equally. And what if are you I, holding the flap sander in though? whether I hold it in my drill press or I hold it in the lathe or I hold it in a okay. drum tool or if I hold it with a, a hand drill, it's, it's, I still have to hold a part somehow. Okay, because I'm, I made a, a Morse taper adapter with quarter inch hole, tall flap sanders in the lathe mm -hmm. and it makes it, you know, I don't know. Yeah, the, the, again, the problem is that the parts are so small. And if yeah. I'm holding the part in a clamp, the clamp is obscuring a fairly large part of the surface from in order for me to get a good enough grip with it. Yeah. Okay. So, 
it, it's just it's dangerous and i like having my fingers in my eyes so i i've just resign myself to the fact that I'm going to be doing a lot of hand sanding. If I can come up with a way that I can avoid hand sanding, I do. Uh, and I've changed the way I use the clamps and the way I do the grips. And to a certain extent, when I can, I change the dimensions of the parts so that I can work with them with more power tools, basically. But there's just times when I have to do things by hand. So for the engine, um, I've turned it down to a cylinder. I've drilled a little bit of a um, recess into the the engine cone. Uh, basically, you're, you're making a really tiny goblet. Um, so now I'm just I'm tapering it before I go in and I hollow the the goblet part. I'm going to go in and just. Um, where I've already drilled, I'm just going to round that, smooth it a bit, um, refine the, the shape of that hole. It doesn't need to go all the way down to the bottom. It's it's there for show. It's it's not. It doesn't have to be even walled. I'm doing basically a little parabolic curve in there as best I can. Um, I just want it to be smooth on the inside. Sometimes I'll go in and um, paint with. Uh, bright red or bright bright red, bright yellow, and bright orange uh, acrylic paint to make it look like fire. Uh, I've recently taken up casting epoxy resin and trying to use pigments and alcohol inks to get a um, engine effect, I guess, of a fiery effect, I guess. I've considered using some of the inlays pen blanks that you can get commercially and just turning them down to cabochons to use as inlays. There's a lot of possibilities for this, but um, in, these in particular are just plain. Uh, now what I'm doing is I'm, si I'm reducing the um, area behind the shoulder a little bit. I don't want to take it down too much because I'm still going to be um, sanding and everything, but eventually I want it to be a half inch. It's going to go into that half inch diameter hole that I drilled in the tail of my spaceship when I was turning, before I turned it. Um, so now I'm just sizing it down. And this is just, this little um, shoulder here is just a little transition piece between the engine and the spaceship body. Um, you could make them larger than the spaceship body, larger diameter, you can make it smaller diameter. This case, I tried to make it pretty much match the diameter, but it really all depends on what you want to do for design. And then again, I sand from 120 up through 400. Um, on the inside and the outside of the, the engine. I'm just going to take it to, you know, final dimension. I want it a little bit undersized for the glue, just so that there's enough room for the, the glue to sit without making the tenon explode. Because the tail of the rocket is actually fairly thin. And then I just cut it off the lathe with a, um, flush cutting saw. So now we're going on to the nose spike. And again, this is the other half of the engine block of wood. The nose spike can be pretty much any shape you want. It's basically just a finial. So a lot of this is, is 
the same kind of turning that you would do if you're turning a box. You're, you're making a finial or a goblet. You're making a, a finial, you're making a, a shape. It's just combined a little bit differently to make a different object when, you, when you're done. Um, one thing I learned over the years, I, I've shipped my work all over the country and I've sold, I've actually sold rockets all over the world. I've, I've had buyers in South Africa. Um, the people in Japan have my stuff, you know? So one of the things I discovered, I used to make these really delicate, very, very pointy finials for the nose spike. And if it didn't sell at a show, it would come back and I would have to repair it because it wouldn't get repacked properly by the people who were shipping my work back or it would get damaged in the mail and, you know, on the way back. And so I came to the conclusion that I just needed to make sturdier <laughs> nose spikes. So this one is, is a little bit beefy um, to keep it, you know, with that aesthetic um, but I've, if you go to my website, there's, I have a lot of, um, different rock, basically all the different rockets that I've done over the years have been on, are on that website and you, you'll see some of the other finial styles. Some of them are more delicate than others. Some of them are more involved than others. Some of them are simpler than others. And yes, that's my, my head. You can see I turn with a face shield. Um, And the other thing that I've discovered is that even rounding the point of the finial just a little tiny bit means that it reduces the risk of the, the very tip of the finial breaking by a, a, an amazing amount. I didn't think it would make that much of a difference, but it does. And um, it also means that if you do what I usually end up doing and fumble the finial when you're taking it off the lathe, you're less likely to puncture your hand. So here, what I'm doing, I'm not going to take this down to final size because I still have to turn the little dome section at the bottom of the nose spike, but I do need some relief back there so that I can get in and do some shaping without running into the tenon or running into the rest of the wood block. And again, as with any finial, you want to leave it, you want to work from the furthest point away from the chuck back to the, towards the chuck. You want to leave as much meat in place to support the work as possible for as long as possible. So even this is not the final diameter of that tenon. I need some clearance to get in to hollow the underside of that dome a little bit where it's going to sit against the nose of the rocket. And I'm using a um, eighth inch parting tool, just the point of it, the corner there to do some really rough hollowing. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just needs to have a little bit of relief. And now I'm just taking down a little bit more to give myself a little bit more clearance. You can do that with a detail gouge too, if you have enough room to get in there. I didn't leave myself enough room. So I ended up doing it with the, the parting tool. I find that that point really works well to get in there. And again, sanding, lots of sanding. And I'll refine the shape of the um, spike with the sandpaper as well. I'm, I'm not proud about trying to get it perfectly with the tools. Sometimes it's just easier to, to get it to a certain point and then sand it the rest of the way to, to thin it out. I can support it a little better. And now I'm taking the, the uh, tenon down to its final diameter. I do this by eye too. I'm, I'm looking for something that's somewhere between 3 16ths and a quarter of an inch and flush cutting saw to take it off. And then that's what the body of the spaceship will look like now with the uh, nose spike and the engine in loosely. They're not glued in yet, obviously. 
but it's starting to come together. This is when it starts to look like a spaceship. I do the finishing before I assemble. Um, it's easier to get the finish into all of the little crevasses and nooks and crannies. Um, I, in this particular case, I'm doing a um, satin finish. So I'm going to do two layers or two coats of shellac. This is um, shellac sanding sealer specifically. So it's de-waxed shellac. And then I'll do over this a um, layer or one or two coats of satin polyurethane gel varnish, the uh, general finishes gel varnish. Um, and when I can, I, I do this kind of thing on the lathe. I've got the lathe set at about the slowest speed, which is I think like 49 RPM, 48 RPM, something like that on my lathe. The fins, again, are a bit of a, of a problem. Um, since they're going to have nails in them anyway to attach them to the ships, I leave the nails long. I don't cut the nails to length until I'm ready to mount them on the rocket. And I use them point in and I'll press the points in so that they're stuck into the wood a little bit. Um, And, you know, if the nail is a little, has a little bit of uh, flashing or something on it or, or cutting marks or something on it, I'll just sand it off a little bit so that it will fit in the hole because these holes are, are actually a pretty tight fit for these nails. Um, but anyway, that triangular piece with all the holes in it is just a little helper piece that I use just to hold the fins while I'm doing finishing. Put the nails in the fins and then stand them up in the, the block between when I'm, I'm putting finish on them and then afterwards they dry there. You know, I leave them there overnight. I can access it, you know, I can pick it up with one hand while I do the finish with the other and then put it back and I've got enough space. Um, I'm gonna have six fins on here because I have two full rockets that I need to do fins for, um, but I've got enough space that the fins don't bump into each other and I can access them all easily without bumping them myself. And the reason I do it this way, I, I have, if I was gonna do a sprayed finish, I would assemble everything first and then do the sprayed finish, but I don't have spray equipment so I end up doing the rattle cans. I don't have an area in my shop that I'm willing to do spray finishing in. So I would have to do it outside and it's too cold. <laughs> I did this at the end of October. It was too cold. Um, the, the rattle cans just aren't happy when it's cold. Um, actually, I don't know that any spray finish would be, but the rattle cans I was using specifically are not. So this is, Considering this is a shellac and polyurethane finish, it's getting, again, two coats of sanding sealer. I'm using a Q-tip to apply the sanding sealer to the, the fins. Uh, being reasonably careful not to get it on the side that's gonna get glue, but I can clean it up afterwards with a little bit of sandpaper, not a problem. And I'm just giving a very generous coat of shellac because the first coat's gonna soak in, obviously. I'll come back and hit it with a second coat once this one's dry. And then um, sand it lightly and then go back with the polyurethane. I find the Q-tips work really well for this as long as you keep them wet. Once the shellac starts to set up, the Q-tip starts to unravel and then things get messy. And on, on other, for other parts, I'll use a, a small rag to apply the shellac, but for the fins to, to get into everything, the Q-tip actually works really well. You 
Yeah, the big problem with, with this is the nails will work themselves loose as you're vibrating the um, fin, you know, manipulating it and stuff. So that can get a little dicey. And for this, I'm doing again the shellac here. I've got the, I'll put the lathe on its slowest speed. Um, I've got a little square of um, cloth that I'll just dip into the, the sanding sealer. I'll apply an even coat on oh, my glove. Yeah, apply an even coat. And um, I don't know how much you, you use shellac. I've, um, if you use it more than I do, you probably know a lot more about it than I do. I, I still consider it fairly mysterious. But what I've discovered is with the, the sanding pad, I, I put enough finish into the pad, or sorry, the finishing pad. I put enough finish into the pad that I can get a good wet surface, continually wet surface, so I don't have to keep going back and, and re-dipping the pad and then the shellac starts to set up. And I keep pressure on the leading edge of the pad with my finger so that the trailing edge is just smoothing basically the finish as it's getting applied. Um, you can sort of see it by the way I'm holding the pad in my, my gloved hand there. Um, But that way I don't get as much streaking I found. And I do apply it in both directions just to make sure I get good coverage just in case there's some uh, anomaly of the surface. So this is after two coats, and now I'm going to just lightly sand the uh, shellac surface down. One thing about this olive wood that was I found interesting is the, it doesn't the grain doesn't raise, and I suspect it's because it's got that resin dye stuff in it. But it you can wet it, you can the shellac doesn't raise the grain, water doesn't raise the grain. So I probably actually didn't need to do this other than to scuff it just to. Um, apply the polyurethane afterwards. And basically all I'm going for here is a, a close to uniform matte surface all over the body of the rocket. And you can see that the uh, tape has actually held up pretty well. That's because of the burnishing. If I don't burnish it, it, it peels up. That's just a little bit of Scotch-Brite pad to smooth things out. If I remember correctly, that's like the equivalent of 600 grit sandpaper or something. Um, I don't remember specifically what the gray pad is. But it just smooths the surface a bit more. I'm using very, very light pressure. I, I'm barely, um, barely putting any pressure at all on that. Yeah, and this is the General Finishes gel top coat satin. I used to use Bartley's. Uh, I guess Bartley's got sold and they don't make Bartley's anymore, which is too bad because I like the Bartley's finish. This isn't bad, but I did like the Bartley's better, Bartley's gel varnish. Um, I don't know if there are any other gel polyurethanes out there that are any good. I haven't tried the Minwax. Uh, if you know of anything, I'd be interested in hearing. Um, the, the key with this is it 
it has to sit for a few minutes. You, you wipe it on and then you, you let it sit for a few minutes and then you wipe it off. So I did the nose spike first and I'm going to do a couple of fins. And um, then I'll go back and wipe off the finish on the nose spike. I'm gonna go back and wipe the fins and you know do another nose spike and it there's kind of a rhythm to it I found with doing the finishing with this gel varnish. And not just with this, I I've I used to use this when I made um, jewelry boxes as well. You know, and again, I'm, I'm barely touching the rag to the um, workpiece when I'm wiping off the finish. I, I just want to take off the excess. I'm not trying to, to buff it all off. Um, you know, I do want to leave some of it on there. It's, it's the danger with working with the wipe on stuff is that when you have to wipe it off, it's, it's really easy to wipe off too much. But you can see I'm going back and forth between you know spikes, the engines, the fins, just to give the finish enough time to to set a little bit before I wipe it back. There's definitely a, a rhythm to it. You know, I, I don't have a lot of finish on the, the rag for this, for doing this. I, I want to apply it and spread it out a bit. And for the spaceship, I'll rub it along with the grain and I'll, as well as um, having a lathe going with it on. And then just lightly take it off and, and lightly buff it with the grain to take off the excess. You know, again, it's, it's very, very low pressure. And now we're on to assembly. Everything's finished. So I've removed the tape. I'm using an eighth inch uh, chisel to just clean up the area that was taped in case any uh, finish got in underneath. You know, and, and again, I, I've got the, the chisel at a very low angle. I'm just literally almost using it like a low angle scraper or something to um, take off a little bit of a little bit of wood and a little bit of the, the finish ridge that comes up around the tape because that is one of the things that happens when you use the, the masking tape the finish will ridge up around it a little bit and I don't want that to interfere with how the fin sets on the rocket Now I'm marking out for where the um, I'm going to drill the holes for the nails to uh, mate the fins to the, to the side of the ship. You could use this technique to attach fins to a, um, you know, a turned urn or a vessel or something too, I suppose. I, I haven't done it. I, I just haven't gotten to it. But I imagine when people attach leg supports to a, a turned vessel, they do something similar. At least I would, whether it was with dowels or with little nails, depending on what the, um, how big the vessel was.
Now the I've already cut off the um, the nails to length so that they match the holes in the rocket and in the the fin. But there's always a little bit of motion when I drill, so I may have to go to a larger one size larger uh, bit to enlarge the holes to give myself a little bit of wiggle room. And that's what I'm doing here is I'm just enlarging these holes a little bit so that the nails, um, the, the fins will seat properly. And then I'll just, I keep double checking to make sure that everything's closing up properly, that everything's gonna mate properly. Uh, just dry fitting everything. Um, before I put the glue on, because once the glue is on, there's no going back. If the fin doesn't sit properly, I have to break it off, which is a pain. And then I have to remove the nails, which is a pain. So I spend a lot of time dry fitting before I, I commit to the glue. And you can see that these are a close enough fit that they're basically held in place already without any any glue. The glue will just uh, keep things secure. These aren't going to be structural. The, the fins that I put on one of my rocket boxes are actually structural. The, the piece will rest on those fins. So the fins will be a little bit thicker. I'll use thicker nails. I'll use epoxy instead of, uh, this is thick super glue. Uh, I'll use epoxy instead of thick super glue to, to um, make the joint a little bit stronger. and then just hold it in place until it sets up. And now I'm just drilling for the mount hole to mount the, the ship on the base. I figured out where I want it to be. You start with, again, with a uh, smaller drill. Um, I'm gonna go up to, I think I used a, ended up with a quarter inch mounting hole to begin with, or to uh, for the final one. So I start with, um, I don't know, around 9.30 or 9, 9.64, something like that. I do it in stages in any event to reduce the risk of tear out. And I use the countersink again before I step up to the next size to try to reduce tear out. Because this isn't going to be seen, if the countersink is a little bit bigger than I need, I can live with that. I can touch up the finish if I have to. I can live with there being a little bit of a divot there because this is the part of it that's going to be hidden by the base. But um, I... So you're not really going to be able to see if there's any, if there's a little bit of extra countersinking here, but it really is noticeable if there's a big chunk that comes out of it because the drill catches on a, on a piece of wood and it splinters off, or if I have to go back and glue it back on, that's a pain because I, I, I can't necessarily get it to be a perfect fit without having to take all the finish off, resand everything. I don't want to do that. So I'm, I'm good with leaving it open. And just so you can see some of the other possibilities with the laminations. This is a different ship, an earlier ship that I did with the uh, same kind of lamination. This is a, uh, if any of your guitar players, you might recognize the kind of purfling black, white, black, white, black, um, five layer pinstriping that'll show up in here. Uh, this is with maple black veneer and uh, I believe that's Brazilian cherry. And this is one of the tapered center layers I was talking about. I've tapered this, this center piece from nose to tail. So doing the glue up, I did have to do the, the center layer glue up separately then flatten it and then apply the um, outer laminations. Um, this is just a slightly different view of it with a Actually, is that true? No, that's a different rocket, my mistake. Um, and then the, the shape of the nose is a little different. And the nose spike is just an extension of the nose. And this is just a longer version. Uh, the, this size, this is about twice the length of 
the one that I showed tonight and it's these fins are big enough that I could actually do things with them on with power tools instead of doing everything by hand. And this is no veneer at all. This is just a um, little bit of leftover olive wood, some figured maple and cherry. So you don't really even need the veneer. You can do whatever you want. Um, and then you can get quite complicated with a staved body. This is just maple veneer or maple and mahogany veneer in a staved um, blank, staved construction blank. And that's basically it. I hope it wasn't too horrible. That was great. Um, Thank you. <laughs>